Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Now, Paul takes this one step further, and this is as far as I'm going to go today. It's just a couple more verses here, but they're really powerful. There's a reason for the comfort that you receive from God. And I want to show you it. It's not just for you. Let me show you this. It says here, the God who comforts us, in verse 4, with, in all of our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. The reason that you get comfort is not just for you, but so that you can comfort what? Others. When they're going through... Now, this might seem like, well, duh, pastor, everyone knows that. Or, I mean, for me, this is, this is mind-blowing to think that God let me go through certain afflictions so that he could show me his comfort. So that when others would be around me going through those afflictions, I would be able to be a comfort to them. I could say, hey, I know what you're going through. Hey, I know where to get comfort in that situation. Now, I, it says, Paul said, for just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also is the comfort that is abundant in Christ. Remember, if you suffer a lot, you need to know that God's comfort is available to you to cover all the suffering. God has enough comfort to take care of every suffering thing that you face. Paul says, if we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and your salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And <clears throat> our hope, he says in verse 7, for you is that you be firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. For we don't want you to be unaware, brethren, of our afflictions, Paul says, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively. Look at that. Excessively beyond our strength. You ever been so, had such a heavy burden, or too heavy for you to lift? I mean, beyond your strength. You're going through something so heavy, it is just, it's got you. Pinned down. Can't move. So that we even, look at this, the end of verse 8, so that we even despaired of life. I'd like you to highlight that if you don't mind. That we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired of life. Those three lines can help so many people. Now you might not think so, but Paul says, indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but rather we would trust in who? In God who raises the dead, who delivered us from such a great peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and yet he will deliver us. Paul, if you know the book of Acts, he says when we were in Asia, we were burdened excessively beyond our strength. Now he's talking about him and Timothy. That they were burdened beyond... They had such a bad day, such a heavy load that... He said, you know, we despaired even of life. Can you picture the Apostle Paul having such a bad... I mean, most people don't think about this. That he had such a bad day, he wished he was dead. I'm just putting it in today's vernacular. I mean, so bad you just wished... You, have any of you ever suffered something so bad that you just wished you were dead? Now, I don't like to tell you what I'm about to tell you because it has really bad, um, powerful memories in my mind because I, when I was a young man, I had cancer. And this is in... I was 18 years old. And uh, at that time, there was this new clinic in Scottsdale, North Scottsdale. They call it today. We call it the Sticks because they were way out past Bell Road back then. And um, it was called the Mayo Clinic. And uh, when I got cancer... 
right away my dad's did the way you did research is you just asked around what's the best place to get help so they everyone referred us to this clinics we had to drive out into the boonie back then the boondocks way out you know into the desert to this new place called the mayo clinic and they hooked me up with this one arm stuff going you know stuff coming out here blood come out and stuff going in this arm and um, you sit there for four hours, and back then it was called me mega dosing with chemotherapy, not micro dosing like they do today. They like exchange all your fluid. The problem with that is, this I don't like telling the story because my mouth is starting to get a really bad taste already. I threw up for five days straight, but I didn't have anything to throw up after the first day. I mean, I had puked everything, and I I threw up. Like I was, a, I was a gymnast. My gut, my my abs were strong. You know, I wish they were like that today, but they were, they were ripped and strong. And the problem with that is when you have that gag reflex and your abs crunch down real hard. I could throw up from here to the sound box, and I kid you not. I mean, projectile vomit. But the problem is after you lose everything in your stomach and you start vomiting the second and the third and the fourth day, the only thing coming out is stomach acid. And you can't keep anything down, and you're spitting this. I mean, you're not trying to. And it goes, unfortunately, I was not a graceful thrower-upper. There's no other way to put it. It just, when it triggered, it just snapped a button, and it shot out. And it, like, forced it up my nose. And, you know, I was one of those people, when I threw up, it just, like, it, oh, my whole head hurt because it just came so fast, and I couldn't control it. And even now, telling you it is the worst flavor is coming into my mouth of just you know the mind is very powerful but I hated going through this time this was this sucked and uh Frey, I don't know if she used that word either cut that out when you guys edit but the uh, <clears throat> it was bad and at the point um you know I was already really really lean as a gymnast I was under four percent body fat I only weighed 119 pounds when I got cancer so in a week's time, I went down to like 108 pounds. My muscles were just, I mean, I was already, you, you, I go like this. They, they used to take us to the activity center to, to body fat weigh us at the beginning of each year. You know, I was on the, the competition team at ASU, and they would put us in a tank. And when I got to my turn in line, they would look at me, and they go, do you throw up your food? I was like, are you kidding me? I hate throwing up, you know? And they're like, um, don't even stick him in the tank. Less than 4%, you know, because I just had paper for skin. You could see every little tendon, every little insertion. And I'd have people walk up to me and go, excuse me, I'm taking anatomy and physiology. And they say that there's like a, a muscle that goes from here up to in, in your muscles of your leg goes here. And then there's one here. And I'd be like, yeah. Oh, wow, it's real. Look, hey, he's a walking anatomy chart, you know, and people used to stop me, ask me stupid questions. I was like, that's weird, you know, because I, I could see where all this stuff connected already because my skin was so paper thin. But to lose, you know, like almost 10 pounds in a week's time, I didn't have 10 pounds to spare is what I'm trying to tell you. So now I am weak. I am so weak. I just, I can't even get up. And uh, I, I just felt like, forget it, man. I don't even feel like being alive. Now, if you ever gone through this, something this bad, you know what I'm talking about, where you feel like you don't even want to roll your head out of the bed. You just, like, I, don't, I didn't have the strength. And I'd, I'd try to get myself to go, and, I, like, and literally it was worse in the mornings. By the end of the day, for some reason, I could, you know, sip some water and try to get, like, I could think a little bit and... And I was the youth leader at this time for a church plant. We were doing Calvary Chapel, North Phoenix with Bob Claycamp, Pastor Bob. And, um, you know, I went to the, <coughs> to the kids and I just told them the truth. I was teaching the junior high on one night, the seniors on another night. And on the junior high night, I remember, we had one night, we had 30 junior high girls. And only one boy showed up that day. Uh, lucky, boy. lucky boy, right? <laughs> Except he was a little nerd. And no other way to put it. His name was Rodney. And Rodney was this little butterball. And he's a cute little kid. But he just didn't have it for the girls, you know. And the poor guy. I mean, he's got 30 girls in the room with him, and he's just clueless. 
and he, you know, it's junior high, so don't worry, it's, it's good, he's clueless, but, but I went in and I told the kids, I had had about a week, uh, my chemo was like maybe 10 days before, so I had been throwing up for that first week, and I was finally starting to stop the throwing up, and I was only two or three days past it, and I was really weak. But I went, it's time for teaching, and I went to the, to the kids, um, you know, to the room, and I said, kids, I, the docs, um, oh, that was another thing they told me. They said, your body doesn't handle this stuff very well. Duh. I could have told them that. They said, well, <clears throat> the problem is, is that we noticed that you're so, because I had had my follow-up, you're so weak that if I give you one more treatment, we're afraid you're going to die from the chemo. Now, this was actually a true thing that happened back then. People don't realize this. Chemo used to kill people, and I was one of the volunteers. I mean, not volunteering to die, but they were just saying, you're, 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 you're obviously one of the candidates that's not going to make it. So we're going to give you a choice, they told me. You get to have your next treatment, and you might die because you're just already so weak and you lost so much, and we don't really see that you have anything else to lose. Or you can die from the cancer. Now, you know what my option was, right? Forget the chemo because the, at least the cancer didn't make me puke, you know. It just made my shoulder rot and fall out. That's, I could live with that, you know. As, at least it was, it wasn't, you know, all my guts just tore up by that, by this point. And so, I was kind of, I, I, to say that I could relate to what Paul's saying that if beyond your strength, he said, right? Didn't he say that right there? Burden excessively beyond our strength even despairing of life. I was pretty much in this verse right here, living it. And I went, Lord, <clears throat> I must tell the kids like it is. You know, the doc says I have like, maybe I might make it to six to nine months from now. They were always so hopeful too, by the way. The Mayo Clinic was not hopeful, I don't think. They said, you, you, the way you are, maybe six, nine, a year at the outset, if some miracle happens, you might make it a year. So I went and told the kids, you know, the doc says, this, if I'm lucky, I'll be um, six to nine months with you. And cool, because I'm going to go be with the Lord. And I already knew the Bible said I get a new body. So I had hope. I had a hope and a comfort from the Lord that I'm getting a new body. And I was sure feeling like getting one right then, I'm telling you, because it was hurting. And I told... told the kids, kids, I, you know, I'll teach you as long as I can till I don't have any more strength. I'm already pretty close, but I'll do the best I can. And um, I don't know how it'll go. And this kid, Rodney, falls on his face. We had this like really thin indoor outdoor kind of carpet. It's like industrial carpet in the room. Not no padding at all. It's like a, it's like this thick on concrete, you know. And that little guy went down on his face. Bam. Lays out straight. I, I don't know where he got this, but he like falls on the floor. Oh, God, please don't let Izzy die. I don't want that old fogey back. <laughs> and I, I can't help but remember the prayer because I was like, what? <laughs> and he was talking about the guy who taught the kids before me. <clears throat> and I was a young man, and he's probably not even as old as I am now telling this story. So I'd be the old fogey in the story today. But he didn't want me back. I mean, he didn't want the old guy back. So I remember him praying, and I thought, I I'm chuckling and cycling, Lord, you heard him. Any of you give the amen to Rodney's prayer? And all the girls, yeah, amen, 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 amen. Okay. All right, let's do Bible study. So we did the study. A week later, I had to go for my next checkup. So you go back, and I hate this. They draw four tubes of blood, not little ones, big, big tubes. And um, I didn't like giving blood. I, I didn't like getting poked with needles. I just, needles didn't do it for me. So I'd be like, lady, don't you miss. And I'd squeeze lightly, just put my thumb here, and my veins will pop out. I had pretty good veins, so that wasn't a problem. She's like, I can't miss that fire hose. I'm like, good. You got one shot, okay, because I don't like getting sick. And I'm not going to look, okay? I mean, I seriously had to close my eyes because I, I, I just, like, get lightheaded if I look at them sticking it in me. Well, we had to wait for the results. So four hours later, nothing fast about the lab at, back then. 
They come back and they go, we need to draw your blood again. I said, no, uh, -uh. look, you did four tubes already. Forget you. No, no. It, um, I said, why? Well, there seems to be some conflicting results in your in your lab results, so we're gonna rerun them. We'll make it stat. I learned what stat meant. It was supposed to be like first in line, you know, right away. Four more hours later. No, it was only two more hours later. So I found out I was actually waiting for two hours for nothing. They didn't even start the test. No. no. <laughs> anyway, you're in line waiting behind other people. But I got pushed to the front. So two hours later, they came back. And the nurse pulled me into the room and uh, had a Jewish doctor. And she was a Christian woman, the nurse was. And <clears throat> the Jewish doctor came in and he's looking at the results and he says, you know, son, you, you, let me confirm, you already said last week you, you decline chemotherapy, right? I said, well, yeah, you said I had a choice and I choose not to die from this stuff. This stuff is horrible. And I mean, I'm literally still tasting there's a weird taste. Anyone, you had chemo, right? And you did? It leaves a weird taste in your mouth, okay? And um, it, I don't know how to describe it, but it's not good. So I was like, I don't, I still got the taste in my mouth from the treatment two weeks ago. I don't want no more. I mean, no. And he looks all perplexed. And he's looking at the, the labs and he's going, I said, what's the problem, doc? And he says, well, there's no way to account for this short of a miracle that we can't find any cancer in your blood anymore. And you only had one treatment. That doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work that fast. And the Lord just, in that very moment, reminded me of Rodney on the floor. You know, don't, don't let us have the old fogey back. And, uh, and, and the Lord goes, did you, did you hear his prayer? Just in my, you know how the Lord speaks to you, just your, like an impression in my mind. No, vo no voice said this out loud. Just, Something the Lord reminded me, did you see the young man praying? I heard his prayer. That's all it was. God went, I heard. And I, in my mind, I could see Rodney on the floor. Oh, God, don't let him die. You know? And the Lord went, I heard his prayer. So I looked at the doc. I said, well, doc, the kids prayed for me. And uh, I guess God did, a, did no problem. God can do miracles, right? I mean, you're Jewish, right? And I felt like... You know, like Moses, he parted the Red Sea and, and you know, um, started telling about Elijah did this. And I tell him a couple of examples from the Old Testament. He goes, this is not Shabbat school. And he throws down the clipboard and storms out. And the nurse has got a smile from ear to ear. And I'm like, what's the matter? She goes, oh, he wants to play God. He doesn't want God to get any credit. He wants to get all the credit. She goes, that was great. Keep going, son. You know, and I left and I thought, God, why did you let me go through all that pain and all that crumminess and all? And it didn't. Let me just tell you, the taste still took a while till it till it faded. And it took a long time till I could get the weight back on. That was really hard. I thought, well, if you lose it that fast, you should be able to bound it back. Right. No, it took me like six, eight months to get just the eight pounds back. And, and just to get back to the weight I was started at. And I felt weaker. When, when I came back to it, I didn't feel strong as I did when I first took the dip. So it was terrible. And I had to go to the coach at, you know, Don Robinson at ASU and say, Coach, you know, I know I'm on the team. I had just made the competition team, but I can't compete. I can't even lift my arm. They had cut a big chunk of my shoulder out and sewn it together and... I can't raise my hand. They say I will never raise my hand more than, more than this much from my side because all the tendons were cut up here. They'll lift your arm. So, you know, I, I think that God made me a little bit of that stubborn Sicilian part because when they said you'll never do it, I went, you want to bet. <laughs> you know, I'll work even harder. <clears throat> I mean, I was doing therapy like as much as I could and and I remember when I got to seven inches from he my hip to my wrist. Yeah! They said I never make it past five. In your face, you know. <laughs> I did it! And I remember the first day I went like that, all the way, without taking this hand to help. And I thought, that, that, was, a, that was like a day of victory. But in between, I forgot to mention, that's about a year and a half of therapy. 
And the whole time, I went, when I went to the gym and told Coach, hey, Coach Robinson, I, I, you might as well take me off the team. He looked at me and said, once you make the team, you're always on the team for life. Get over there and work out. But Coach, I can't lift my a hand. You know, and I used to, I was one of the top pommel horse guys. Do you know what you can do on the pommel horse when you can't go like that and push out? Because you had to push with your shoulder to swing a loop around the pommels. And I used to swing this way. So I thought, well, this arm's still good. I'll just jump over the horse this way. And then as soon as my hand would come down, it would collapse and I'd whack my head and... I had more wax on the head from the pommel horse, trying to make one. And I remember it took almost a year till I could do one circle around the pommel. And guys, if you if you ever been able to already do this and then you got to relearn it and go back, and I was going the opposite direction now than what I did. A year and a half later, I could actually do two in a row. You think, well, but what's the big deal? Well, you can't actually ever do anything on pommels till you can at least swing, you know two or 10 or 30 or 50, you know. And all of a sudden, a year and a half later, I could swing both ways, which actually came to my advantage later because I could actually compete and do all my circle work in, do my flare work, and then come out going the opposite direction. And I had to tell the judges, pay attention, I'm going to switch directions because I could do it so smooth they couldn't believe it. They're like, nobody swings both ways. Everybody's either left brain dominated or right brain, and you only go one way or the other. You know what? God does. He can put you through some really crummy things, make you relearn a whole bunch of stuff just to prove people wrong. And he gave me extra risk, originality, and virtuosity, which is how part of the grading system back when they only had 10 points that you could make instead of 16 or whatever it is now. I was back in the day when they only, a 10 was a 10. Yeah, you got a 10, you know. But I did that, and I, I said, Lord, why did you let me go through all this? Why? And then he says, all the comfort I comforted you with is so that you can do what? Comfort others. And I didn't like this answer. Because what I went through was not easy. And it sucked. I mean, that's the best word I can use. It was horrible. And I was like, God, I don't like your plan. It's kind of crummy. You know, you let me go through this afflictions and then you comfort me why and then he tells me because I know you would make it but you see that person over there they're not doing so good and they need to see that you made it so that they can have hope that they'll make it you're going to use the comfort I comforted you with to comfort them now I hated this answer okay I'm just telling you straight away don't recommend chemo for nothing um can't. I had a bad experience. Okay. Some people tell me it's better today. Good on for you. I just I didn't have cancer at that time. So, you know, it reminded me like I I don't you know the Lord has the Lord has used these these things that are some painful painful memories for me, and I think Lord, but you just use this to to help others. And this, this particular thought he buried in my heart with one more life example. And it what came to a day, and I've shared this testimony before, but some of you, this will resonate with you. My, my, mom, and, my mom and dad got divorced when, uh, my mom divorced my dad when I was 11. Didn't like the pain of that. We were taught Italian, Roman Catholics, you never divorce. You know, it just does, doesn't happen. Till death do you part, not till someone decides to leave. But my mom went on a small drinking episode uh, and struggled with that for, for a few years. And she would wind up remarrying uh, fellows that she found at the bar. Those are always the best shopping. And um, of course, that didn't work out the first time, so she divorced the second guy and she went and got a third one and different bar and then um, that didn't work so she got a fourth one that didn't work so she got a fifth one 
And by the time, you know, from 11 to, I guess I was 17, she was on number five at 17, and by 17 and a half, I think she was done with five. So in about six and a half years' time, I went to four different stepdads. Now, for those of you that have experienced the pain of divorce, whether it was you going through it or your kid as a kid watching your parents do it, you know that that also is like about as sucky as chemotherapy. I'm just going to put it how I felt. It had stunk. And it makes you question a whole bunch of things like, you know, like, are they divorcing because of us kids? Is it, you know, as a kid, you don't, you don't see the problem might be with the parent. You think somehow it's somewhat you did or, you know, and I was the oldest of six. So I didn't know what was going on, but it put a lot of hatred in my heart. And then Christ came into my life and changed that hate to love and took unforgiveness and replaced it with forgiveness and mercy and grace. And those things changed me from the inside. And as I went through those things, I went on to, like I told you, to be a youth leader. Later, I would uh, wind up serving the Lord with Pastor John Higgins in Calvary, Tri-City, in Tempe, uh, Chandler area, Mesa area. And... Um, one day, one of my high school students, it was actually one of the girls, regular girls, her friend that she had only brought to the youth group twice. This blonde gal comes in my office, and she, I won't tell any names or anything, but she came in my office, and she, uh, Arizona, by the way, is a, a gun-friendly state. You know, I was raised around guns, not afraid of guns. We used them to hunt and uh, protect your house, you know, coyotes and stuff like that, wolves. So, anyway... She comes into my into my office and she sits down kitty corner from me across the room. My office is a little rectangle, so I'm at one corner, and she's at this corner. And uh, she's about as far as you folks are from me, right there. I, maybe a smidge closer, about right here. That's about how far we're seated apart. So not close enough. And she she reaches in her handbag and she pulls out a a, a gun, and she cocks it. And she puts it up to right here and says, she got two seconds to tell me why I shouldn't pull the trigger. I, I don't even feel like living. Okay, two seconds, not really a lot of time to work with here. So if you've ever been under the pressure of this, you go, Lord, what do I, I mean, like, let me have time for a long prayer because I'll be done in two seconds. She's going to kill herself. So help, Lord. And the Lord goes, literally, I look at her like, Lord, what's, what, I don't even know, what, to, what do I say? What, what's going on with her? Like all in my mind in a flash, that has passed through my mind. I'm hoping that didn't take two seconds. Like it was a fast, fast mental prayer to the Lord. What is wrong? What do I say? Hurry, help me, Lord. And I looked at her and I said, so um, your parents are getting divorced, huh? And she, she looked stunned. How do you know? I was thinking, God, I'm really glad you were right on that one. Because <laughs> the gun went from here to about right here. It still pointed up maybe the nose or the front of the face to get it shot off, but it wasn't under her chin anymore. Just went to that. How do you know? And what, <clears throat> has it happened already? That's my next one. You know, did they already get to the divorce thing, or is it, are they in the talking part? Like, where are we at in the stage? I said, well, no, they just said they're, they're talking about getting divorced now. My whole life, my parents have always been a rock. You know, they're always together. They can't divorce. And she starts going on, and, and she's telling me this, and now they're talking they're going to separate this weekend, and I just can't take it. And, and wh why am I telling you anyway, she says. And she waves the gun like this. And she puts it back to her head. I might as well be dead. And she's, I see that the tension on the finger is moved onto the trigger. This is not good because I don't know how much spring is in this. You know, some triggers, the lightest touch will set them. And some, you got to pull a little. And she's already got her finger flexing on the trigger. And I go... She goes, why am I telling you anyway? You wouldn't know. Your life is perfect. 
I'm thinking, yeah, I just lived through cancer and I five marriages and divorces. Yeah, my life's perfect. I said, yeah, I wouldn't know what it's like to have my parents just thinking about getting a divorce for the first time. And she goes, what? I said, yeah, yeah, this is only your first time. I said, my mom married, you know, my dad, and she divorced him when I was 11. But don't worry, she remarried. And then she divorced him. And then she remarried and she divorced him. She remarried, she divorced him. She remarried him, divorced him. And this girl looks at me and the gun now is full into her lap. And she goes, and you're still alive? You're still alive after that much? And the Lord goes, do you remember you asking me why did I let you go through all this? 2 Corinthians chapter 1. All the comfort that I comforted you with so she could be comforted right now. Was it worth it? And I wound up, of course, being able to lead her. She, she had come to youth group, but she didn't know the Lord yet. So I got to lead her to Christ in my office. I got to get the gun away from her. And I got to send her home full of hope. And you know, as the weirdest thing is, I went home scratching my head. You know, Jan's like, how's your day at work, honey? Where, where did you get a gun? Uh, so, you know, come home to tell your wife the stories of the office that day, you know. Yeah, I went in and the girl was going to kill herself. And, and it's really weird what the Lord told me to say to her. And my wife, who's Miss Compassionate, see, now I already have a very compassionate wife. She's like, oh, that sounds like God. Yeah, you know, like puts you through it so you can comfort someone else. Like she's born and raised in the Lord. She like knows, I'm like new to this still. She's like, oh yeah, that's just like the Lord. God of all comfort. I'm thinking, man, I've got to reread this again. I'm pretty sure it's in there. I remember it in Corinthians 1. I actually remember the chapter. I just didn't remember the verse. And I had to like relook it up. What was the verse again? It's a, a, no, 2 Corinthians 1. Yeah, yeah, 2 Corinthians 1. Burden excessively beyond strength, despairs of life, so that we won't trust in ourselves, but we will trust in who? In God who raises the dead, and so that we can comfort those with the comfort with what we were comforted with. Hmm. Verse 4, 5, 8, 9. Next week I'll bring you back to verse 10. We'll pick up there. Who delivered us and gave us hope. I'll start with that next week, okay? That's the bridge for next week. If you would read ahead to the end of the chapter, this is a powerful chapter. This has real life application. And it actually helps me cope with some of the stuff I've gone through. It might help you too. Yeah, I, I really think, you know, it says the Word of God is living, it's active. It's able to divide between thoughts and intents, and between the bone and the marrow. It, it, it like really cuts down to the, the nitty-gritty of life. But we just need to look at it. Stay it before study. See what the Lord has there. Because there's some powerful words there. Okay, and they'll encourage you. That's right, brother. Would you join me? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege we have of having your holy scriptures even to lay in our lap in the open on a beach in Hawaii. I pray that these words would not stay the, but on the page, but rather sink into our hearts, to our minds, Lord, that we would be able to have your spirit call them back to our remembrance when we need them. Lord, make us a people filled with your hope, filled with your comfort, tasting of your mercy, Lord. Thank you for being a merciful God to me. I know there's a lot of others that would give the amen to that, Lord. Thanks for your mercies on all of us. And those that don't know your mer sweet mercy, Lord, and your grace, I pray you would just let them taste of it this day. That they could get that wonderful comfort and hope that you've given to us. Pray for our dear Dottie up in the hospital right now that you would just give her your comfort. Help her, Lord, in her, in her time of need. Help all of us. We ask as we go further, forward in this week, Lord, give us what we need. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, Lord, as we forgive those that have sinned against us. And Lord, if it's okay, convert our enemies from souls to Pauls. 
that they could be there to work for you instead of against you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me listening to a closing song? Send you off in the joy of the Lord. To have a great week. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.